Work, 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 work. I've always hated this phrase because really it's people who make our ideas. It's people who make our work. It's people who make the decisions about our work. We have to start thinking differently about what we're prioritizing, especially as leaders in this industry. And instead of prioritizing what we're saying is the output, prioritize the input going into it. So for me, as a leader, when I start really thinking about what my priorities are and how I want to lead a business and how I get us to getting to great ideas for our clients' businesses, right? I'm actually thinking, okay, what I need to prioritize is I need to create teams and environments that allow us to, that get us to creative, innovative ideas that help our clients' business, right? So it's shifting where we're putting that importance. And guess what? Here is what's awesome. I have a leg up for us. Ends up, research shows that if we have socially diverse teams, it actually leads to better performance, to unconventional innovation. I think that's interesting, unconventional innovation. Better prepared, it makes us harder working, and it enhances our creativity. Simply by being around people who are different than us, we get here. I want this, this is great. <laughs> We could all have this if we had socially diverse working teams. But, uh, and this, this quote was actually referenced, I think, in Carter's speech. Um, for some reason, I think our, our industry is a bit challenged in that we, we haven't gotten to the point where we've started to really equate that, there, that the lack of our diverse teams, that there's a correlation between the lack of creativity, innovation, and progression in our industry. We talked a lot earlier in some of the earlier panels, we talked about nonlinear careers, right? Well, what if we just did things differently? What if you didn't have to? Like, you know, what if we really recreated what this culture was? We have to start thinking bigger, and we have to start seeing that there is absolutely a correlation between our lack of diversity and our lack of progression. And what's interesting is while sometimes our industry is a bit too insular to see that, talent has seen that. Young talent is seeing it. The ANA came out a couple, it was a couple months ago, mm -hmm. to say that we have a crippling talent crisis. Crippling, very dramatic word. Um, and there are many reasons cited for that, right? But diversity is absolutely one of them. And in fact, Adobe just did a study, it came out today, thank you Adobe, um, and it's called the Diversity Disconnect. And 76% of the, I think, 750 people that they surveyed said that they would not come to work at a company that did not take diversity seriously. That is 76%. That is a huge amount of talent that we could be seeding to someone else's innovation, someone else's work. And 20 years ago, like when I first came into the industry and before that, there weren't that many options if you wanted to be in like a cool, creative, professional world. There weren't that many options where you could go for Keg Fridays. Now there's a lot of options, right? We've got consultancies, we've got publishers, we've got tech companies, we've got startups. There's other places for our talent to go. And as Carter mentioned in the last presentation, that those that are younger than us are more diverse than ever. So when, we're, when you're young talent, looking to go and start your career, the question is even why would you come to our industry, right? Our industry isn't really doing anything behaviorally, we're starting to talk about it, behaviorally that's really being able to foster and create inclusive teams, right? And then if you're a woman or a person of color, or both, we, we, we can exist both, um, what's our future? You know, what does it look like up on that ladder, right? So we have 41% of women entering our industry, but only 25 in executive leadership, and then we get to big fat zero later, da later on, and that's not even the stats if you're a person of color. So if we, so there's really no, no surprise that we're in a talent crisis, which leads me back to our product, right? And if we think about our product as the people and how we're making sure that those people are working, our work is better when our teams are socially diverse. And if what we get paid for is our product and whom we pay is our people, it stands to reason that diversity also has an impact on our money. Diversity has an impact on our profits. And in fact, this is not just hypothetical. This is proven. Our friends over at McKinsey, smart people that they are, um, they have worked and examined 
I think it's 766 companies. And what they have shown is that the most diverse companies are 35% more likely to get financial returns that are above average, 35%. That is a huge number. What about those companies that are the least diverse? They don't have a shot. They don't even get to average. They are statistically proven to not perform as well as the more diverse companies. That's a pretty tremendous argument to be able to take back to your organizations. And I see you guys taking pictures of the slides. Please do that. Take pictures of the slides. Take down the statistics. Take charge of the situation back at the ranch when you go back. Uh, because these are, these are great arguments to bring. The other thing is, if uh, you do increase your diversity, there is almost a linear correlation um, to what's happening here. So this is actually a statistic that um, is for women. And if you increase the number of women from zero to 30%, which I think Carter talked about earlier, you get a 15% increase in profitability. Who would say no? My mic is not on, but who would say no <laughs> <laughs> to a 15% increase in profitability? The same holds true. Um, Ernst & Young did a study. The same holds true for when you talk about racial and ethnic diversity. If you increase the percentage on your teams, the percentage of your profit similarly goes up in a linear fashion. That's a pretty powerful argument that directly links diversity to profitability. And it's not just in theory. We see this in practice every day. It's not just a McKinsey consultant sitting in a dark room in the middle of the night with an Excel spreadsheet. You're seeing this in practice with your clients asking for diversity. Um, Hewlett Packard, heard of them. Um, they are not only asking for diversity, they're actually celebrating it right now. Um, there's a quote here, we believe diversity and inclusion are driving the results that we see in the marketplace today. They are directly attributing it to the increases of women on their agency teams. They went from 40 to 61%. Um, that's tremendous. They are working on the people of color. They only went from 20 to 25%, but given the research that Amber just showed you, imagine what they could do when they actually move that number. General Mills, in 2016, they were spending 624 million. They are looking to increase that double digits by 2018. Guess who has access to that money? Only agencies that are diverse. Only agencies that are diverse have access to this account that is growing at this clip. They want women to be 50%, they want minorities to be 20%. And that is a great thing that we're seeing from the clients. Yeah. And the, you know, these are just two clients, and I'm sure there's a lot of people sitting here, they're like, well, my clients aren't asking for that yet. <laughs> well, these, you know, HP and General Mills, they're not just doing this out of the goodness of their hearts or because there's a moral case for it. They're doing it because they're seeing it impact their business. Because just like they're our clients, they have clients, they have customers, they have consumers, and their consumers are changing. Their consumers are diverse, and we'll, we'll get into some of those numbers earlier, but they're doing this because they're seeing real business results because of it. Absolutely. And if these business results aren't enough, which by the way they should be, you should totally be able to walk up to all of the leadership at your company and say, we can get 15% more profit, we can have a linear relationship of increasing diversity and increasing business results. That should be enough of an argument for your organizations. But in case it's not, there's one more element of the business case which we think is pretty powerful, and that is the idea of persistence. She persisted, he persisted, we want our businesses, our very industry, our livelihoods, our voices, our legacies to persist. And what do we even mean by persistence? Well, we mean the story of survival. Um, if you guys remember a company called Kodak? They don't really exist anymore. You're not taking photos of these slides with Kodak cameras. And one of the reasons that they haven't is Warren School actually did a study, and it wasn't just that they weren't innovative. It wasn't that they didn't keep up with technology trends. It was because they used the word insular. They had an insular culture where they actually were not in touch with the outside world. They failed to grasp that that outside world was changing. And unfortunately, that's what also we are doing with our industry. Madison Avenue 
not the outside world. New York City, not the outside world. We are in a bubble and we see things happening all the time. There was a major ad agency, CEO. You guys might have heard of the scandal. There was sexism complaints, racism complaints, et cetera. And recently, Campaign did a survey and said, do you think that there was long-term sustained damage to the agency brand? 63% of people said yes. This wasn't a blip in the PR news cycle. This wasn't some weird little article in HuffPo. This was, no, there was sustained brand damage to these kinds of actions at the top. Another agency, who will also remain nameless, um, had one email that was perceived as racist by a client. Another client saw it, another client saw it, all three of them left. So if we keep doing that, if we keep perpetrating these acts that are not diverse, that are not respectful of gender, not respectful of race, we will see more and more clients walking out of our doors. Yeah. We will not persist. And so back to the outside world, we, when we were talking before about what we do, right, and what our product is, it's about these ideas and the work that we create, but it has to connect to people. It has to connect to the outside world. So let's take a look at some of the trends that we're seeing. So globally, we're about, from a demographic perspective, we're still, we're 50-50, right? 50 men, 49.6 women. What I think is interesting is 50% of the world's population comes from just seven countries. China, India, US, Indonesia, Brazil, Pakistan, and Nigeria. All of those are such, give such wildly different cultural contributions to our world community. 50% of our population. Here's another really interesting thing. By 2060, the number of Muslims will be equal to the number of Christians. That has never happened before. In the US, so we're still about 50-50, right? Right now, we're about 61% white. Just to give you context, in the 1980s, we were 80% white. That's how fast things are changing. We're 18% Hispanic Latino, we're 13% black, we're 6% Asian. If you recall, we were talking about the numbers in advertising. So we're 18% in the, uh, in the US, but we're only 12% in ad, uh, ad industry. We are 13% black, we're only 5% in this industry. That's ridiculous. 2016, almost two years ago, babies of color that were born outnumber white babies. By 2044, there will be no one racial or ethnic group. There not one will dominate. That's a big change, right? And these, this is the world, this is the outside world that we need to create ideas to connect to. And guess what? We have purchasing power, we buy things, and we buy a lot of things. We've got three trillion in spending power in this country. Uh, now this stat has, has been around for a while, where we are, uh, women are 70 to 80% drive most of the purchases, right? And that's happened for a while. But what the difference is now is that 40% of households with children under the age of 18 count women as the only or the primary breadwinner. So while we had always been driving purchases, now we're also bringing home the money in more ways than we ever have before. And guess what people with money do? <laughs> we talk. <laughs> we buy things and we talk. And in fact, what we see is that women, people of color, are really using the power of their voice. You see something, you say something. It's wrong. You try to make it right. How many of you have been following the Nivea story? <laughs> Let's take a look at some of those ads. They're a little bit painful to see, right? It, it really <sighs> is really, really hard to take a look at some of this work. I mean, visibly lightens. And some person had to go in there and Photoshop that whitening action right there. Um, someone had to go and hire directors, art directors, cast the ad on the right that says, re-civilize yourself for a black male. These should not be happening in 2017 or That's ever. That's the appropriate reaction. Yes, exactly. She's exactly. literally like I'm in shock. I'm watching your faces. <laughs> um, and we didn't even put the one out there that says, white is purity. That was the most recent one, too, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, white is purity. So yeah. guess what, your reaction? Google that. We, yeah. of course, went on social media because, of course, um, and what are people saying? These are, these are funny, but they're clearly making a point. You've seen the Pepsi ad. So Pepsi, <laughs> we've done it. 
we've made the most tone deaf ad of the week, maybe the year. Nivea, hold my beer. <laughs> okay. Another person on social media, I completely understand why they pulled the white is purity ad. White is purity doesn't roll off the tongue. But white supremacy, that has a certain ring to it. So again, these people are using provocative language, but what they're also using is the power of their voice to tell brands, no, you're not getting it right. Little homework for you. Um, go to YouTube later on and look up the SNL spoof for Levi's called Wokes. Um, <laughs> they are about skirt pants, which might be what I'm wearing, but skirt <laughs> pants <laughs> that are identity free and they come in many colors, quote unquote, none of which are dominant. Um, and so <laughs> it was a spoof that shows that our industry, our messaging, our communications, no one knows how to get it right yet. We're still getting it right, but we need to band together because this is wrong. This is very wrong. Um, the other thing that people are using is not just the power of their voice, they're using the power of their actions. Um, hashtag boycott Dove was on fire a while ago. Nivea, people aren't just saying stop making those ads. People are saying stop making those products. And that is important. We're talking about the persistence of our businesses. We're talking about the persistence of these brands. We're talking about the persistence of these clients who are driving our very economy. This is important. It is the story of sustainability. And if you don't have diversity, you're not going to exist. So I had said earlier when we were introducing ourselves that um, Kathleen and I bonded 12, 15 years ago um, because we both really believe in, in trying to create systemic change. Well, last year, I think it was during the election. Very much we during the election. We were bonding again. Um, and as we both, also as parents and as mothers, are, we're trying to kind of scratching our heads, like what else can we be doing, right? So there's stuff that we're doing within the industry. But what else can we be doing in the world? And so about a year ago, we started an organization called On Behalf. And On Behalf's mission is to raise a generation of kids without hurtful bias. And one of the most important tools that we have in that mission is books, is children's stories. And I don't think I have to tell anyone in this room how powerful imagery is, how powerful words are. It starts to, from the very beginning, shape who we are and shape how we see the world. One of the publishers that we work with is a publisher called Lee and Lowe, who is dedicated to, to making sure that they publish diverse books. And one of the things, one of the criteria that they look for is they say they want to publish books that are both mirrors that reflect in and windows that reveal out. It's time for us to get there. It's time that we have both mirrors and windows into the outside world. Absolutely. And the reality is if we don't, we, we clearly believe we will, we will become irrelevant. And we've shown you today that it's not just our belief, but there is research, there is hard fact, there are statistics that prove that diversity has a business case. It does affect your product. It does affect your profit. It does affect the persistence of your very business. Yeah. And it is on all of us to make diversity not the trade-off that some others purport it to be, but to make diversity a priority. Diversity cannot wait. It is on all of us, and it is time. Thank yeah. you. Well, and actually, I want to say one thing to oh, that. Oh, she wants Sorry. to say one more thing. One, Sorry. One more thing. It's but time often, for <laughs> Often, I think in a lot of organizations, we tend to think that diversity and inclusion is a human resources problem to solve. And that is certainly a big part of it, right? What I'm hoping this group here and for the leaders in this room, I hope that you're also seeing it's a business problem to solve. And we have to start thinking about, about it that way. We're working, of course, with our internal teams, but we have to look at it as a business problem that we need to solve. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Easy ones. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
oh, I can't wait to answer this. <laughs> right, right. That's a great question, and I really can't wait to answer it. Um, <laughs> have you guys been on Fishbowl recently? It's a sort of insider's network where a lot of the younger generation of our industry go. Um, there are entire threads um, on this, and people have posted questions about this, which is, is it okay to advertise those products when the consumers actually want them, when the consumers actually value? I'm from, I'm from the Philippines, and um, my grandmother used to always say, <laughs> my grandmother used to always come up to me and say, oh, I like it when you don't have a tan. Killed me. Um, because in the Philippines, the fairer that you are, the more it means that your family didn't need to work in the fields, your family didn't need to do manual labor. So my answer to this is a very personal one, but I also believe it professionally, which is, no, it's not okay. Because these products are there because of the messages that people have been hearing for years. It's there because of the systemic institutional racism that has caused people to believe that white is purity or that dark is not. Um, so again, I think you saw some of the voices that are already speaking up saying, I'm not gonna buy that product. In fact, stop making it. Stop making it at all. It's not right. Um, and that's, I think, the real way we tackle the problem at a structural, systemic way. Right. The three steps. Three step program. Three steps. Three steps. Um, We're in a focus. Three. There's like so many. So you, you may not agree with this, but in some ways when you're at a small, is it independent? No. But sometimes when you're at a small shop, it can, uh, it sometimes is a little bit easier than at the kind of the larger organizations. The very first thing to do is when you have an open position, make sure that you're interviewing candidates from every background. I mean, just start there. And that sounds, uh, it almost sounds obvious, but oftentimes, because we all know how fast our business moves, we want to get people in there, we want to get people in, we've got to get people in there, and like, hey, Susie came in, Susie, you're here, right? Always be interviewing. Even when you have no open positions, always make sure that you're reaching out and always having candidates and that you're meeting diverse candidates. There's J.J. Uh, Abrams um, has said that one of the things that he has done with the production, with the, uh, production companies that come to him is that he will not see a script. Like throughout the year, he has to make sure that the scripts are from, that reflect the population of this country. So he wants to see 50 women, 50 men. He wants to see 13% African American. He wants to see 6% Asian. We have to start doing that and demanding it for ourselves when we're recruiting. And then the other thing is, I joked earlier, you guys are all from New York. Um, if you see something, say something. That's the subway, right? Do that with diversity also. Um, there are graceful ways, elegant ways, poised ways for you to raise your hand. Um, someone came up to me once, and it's a leader at my agency. Um, all you KBSers, shut your ears for a second. I won't name names. But they came up to me and they said, Kathleen, I need you on a pitch because you're a woman. I said, person's name. You need me on a pitch because I win pitches. <laughs> <laughs> so, because you win pitches, because you're a woman, because you had the guts to stand up and ask this question about what you could do, which can be so very, very hard, if you see something, say something, and then give them a solution. So I, to add to that, when I was uh, working for a design firm, which had started, which some of the folks are here, um, but when we started, we were only 15 people. Um, one of the things, we were 15 people and we were majority guys, white guys. <laughs> I will tell you this, and these are the types of stats that might help prioritize it. Within 18 months, we made it a priority to have diverse talent, gender, race, from around the country. Um, within 18 months, our revenue went up 60%. 18 months. Within 18 months, our profit margin went up 80%. It works. 
It really does. Oh, we, we have, to, we have to wrap up. But ask us questions afterwards. Come find us. Oh, yeah, come find us. Thank you.